Okay, so the two things that I want to show to you today are Slim and SAS. So in the web world, there's a lot of different variants of languages that compile down to the things, the standard things that web browsers understand. So a web browser understands HTML5. A web browser understands CSS uh, version 3 and below. It does not understand markup that looks like this, which is slim markup, nor does it understand uh, markup which is enhanced with something called SAS, which has extra things like variables in it and you know mixins, which are like types of functions. But so how, if we want to use these extra types of languages, what needs to happen is a compilation step. So if you write your CSS using the variant SAS or SCSS, you need it to be compiled to CSS before it's actually served out to your end user. If you want to write your templates in a style which uh, is called slim, which I really like and we're going to investigate today, you need that to be then compiled to HTML before it gets served out to your end user. Uh, in the Rails world, there's also CoffeeScript that people use uh, in place of JavaScript, and that gets compiled by the asset pipeline into uh, plain old JavaScript. Uh, in the latest versions of JavaScript, uh, like ES6 and beyond, many of the niceties that were present in CoffeeScript have been pulled into JavaScript proper. So you could then write in ES6 in a Rails project and have that compiled down to ES5 before it was sent to your web browser because web browsers don't fully support ES6. So there's a lot of this transpiling going on in the web world. Uh, much of it is built into Rails and some of it you have to add a few gems to get access to it. So what are these things? Well. Take a look at this, uh, at this document right here. Doc type HTML, HTML, nested within HTML, you got head here and the title and a few metas, you got body down below. It sort of looks like a standard HTML document, but notice that there are no close tags, there's no triangle brackets. Uh, it is similar to Python in that white space is meaningful. So indenting something actually means that the indented portion of the code belongs to the stuff that it's indented within. And so having head indented inside of HTML means that when this gets transpiled to HTML, you will have a head tag that's within your HTML tag and you'd further have title and meta tags that are then uh, within the head. Same thing goes for this body tag here. We'll have an H1 inside of it. This right here, starting out a tag with a hash mark, will generate a div for you, and it will apply an ID of content to that div. And you can also see some things here like embedded Ruby, instead of having to have like the less than percent and the less than percent equals, you just use a dash when you have embedded Ruby. So unless the items are empty, generate a table, and then loop over each one of the items, making table rows, else, display no items found. And so equal signs do echoing into elements, and dashes perform ERB. So a lot of people, when they are writing Rails code, are using Slim, or uh, there's a similar very, very similar related technology called Haml. So you'll see both Slim and Haml used in place of HTML uh, by a lot of Rails programmers. Why would a person use this type of markup instead of HTML? Less symbols and brackets. It's much more human readable. Uh, your, your machine is now generating the markup, so you're almost guaranteed to have valid markup because you're never, the machine's never gonna forget to close a tag, the machine's never gonna forget, or typo, you know, the beginning of the tag and the end tag's not quite the same. You're, you're guaranteed to have very clean markup and valid markup, and it also just removes a bunch of the cruft from standard uh, ERB. So we're gonna look at how to add this into a Rails project. Uh, that we have to add by way of a gem. SCSS, the variant of CSS that a lot of Rails programmers use, that's 
part of the curated gems that are Rails. So by default, in a Rails application, all of the style sheets are .scss. They're already SAS enabled. You can put plain old CSS into them and it works just fine, but if you want to use uh, the SASS variant of CSS, that's just built into Rails. Uh, what does that give you? Well, let's see some of the things that uh, SAS gives you. So there's a little bit of confusion here. There's two variants of, of SAS. There's like SAS proper, and then there's this thing called SCSS. SAS proper was highly influenced by the sort of the slim slash Hamel style of uh, having meaningful white space. So here's a snippet of SCSS, and you can see in it we have variables, something that's not normally possible in CSS. You have a variable here called font stack that you could define a font stack and use that throughout your CSS by name. And then if your font stack ever changes, you change it in that one place. Here's a color being defined by a variable. You might have a bunch of corporate colors defined by name used throughout your CSS. And if the corporate colors ever change, you could change those variables and they would sort of be changed throughout your, your code. It looks like, in all other cases, regular SCSS. The SAS variant takes things further by, you, know, you can see here when I switch back and forth between them, removing the semicolons and the curly braces. So the semicolons go away and the white space becomes meaningful in that by indenting these properties below body, they will belong to the body. Uh, most people uh, do not use the SAS variant anymore. The default is to use SCSS because it's more sort of backwards compatible with regular old CSS. You can just drop regular old CSS into an SCSS file and have it work, whereas you can't do that with SAS. I like the look and feel of SAS a lot better. It's just a lot cleaner, but I don't, uh, I don't use it anymore. I use uh, SCSS, and I would recommend that that's what, what you do as well because you get that backwards compatibility. So if you ever want to grab some, like a CSS snippet off the web or something, you can just drop it into your file and it'll just straight up work. So what else does SAS or CSS, SCSS give us? Well, it gives us those variables. That's super nice. Uh, it gives us hierarchical nesting so that the nested structure of our styling rules matches the nested structure of our markup. So here is some code where we have a nav rule defined and then nested within the nav is some styling rules for ULs, LIs, and As. If we were doing this with regular old CSS, you would target A space UL and you would have these rules and you would target nav space LI and you would have those separate rules. With SAS, you can sort of nest your rules to match the nesting of the actual markup, which I just cognitively, I think works a lot better. Uh, when you have that hierarchical matching. And you can also mix and match it as well. So you can, uh, if you have something uh, sort of heavily nested and then at one point you do a chained match, that works. You get partials in SCSS. Uh, they're similar to partials that you use in, in Rails. So you can sort of include chunks of CSS, common chunks of CSS, uh, import statements, Mixins are really nice. They're sort of the ability to create something akin to a method call in CSS. This is really nice for as new features are added to CSS, they are usually added in a vendor prefixed way first and then are rolled out as standards. Uh, so it can get really tiresome to have all of your vendor prefixed uh, sort of properties scattered throughout your uh, CSS document. So for example, in the early days before border radius was a standard CSS property, you had to include in your CSS the vendor prefix for WebKit, for Mozilla, for Microsoft, you know, and then the standard uh, property. Here we create a mixin called border radius that takes in a radius uh, parameter and it applies that to all of the vendor prefixes. And then throughout our code, whenever we want to apply a radius to something, we just use that mixin with a particular value. And then when this gets compiled out, it'll include all the vendor prefixes for us. 
So not necessary anymore for something like border radius, but there's always new things being added to CSS and they're always added in that vendor prefixed way. And so this saves us the hassle of having to manage the vendor prefixes all over our CSS. We manage them in one place through a mix-in. And then uh, something that I haven't played around too much myself with uh, SCSS is the ability to treat styling rules in a more sort of object-oriented manner where you can sort of apply uh, some type of inheritance to the rules that you are, uh, are building off of. So notice here we have this message class being defined so that a message will have a border and padding and a color extended to it. And then you have something called success, which extends message, meaning that it's going to inherit these properties but add a border color of green. Error will also extend message and warning will instead extend message, but they each apply a different border color. Again, a really nice feature, right? This is, this is stuff that's common to all three of these classes. You can do that with plain old CSS. Uh, I think it makes it a little bit more clear when you do it just by way of this extend property. So that's some of what is offered by CSS. So let's see how we can add these two properties or two uh, types of styling and markup generation to a Rails app. I'm going to create a new Rails app. Rails new uh, SCSS uh, slim. Then I'm going to close a bunch of these tabs in my editor from the last project and open up my SCSS slim and open up its gem file. Okay, so get add dot. Oh, I need to navigate to the SC. SS slim file. Yeah, so I just created a new project and I, I named it SCSS slim. It's a new Rails project. Uh, commit initial commit of new Rails app. In the gem file, you'll see that we've already got support for SCSS. So it's just like so common in the Rails world to use this style of styling that it's just part of the curated set of gems that Rails comes with by default. Uh, Slim is not included, and so we can add it at below here. I'll say like project uh, specific gems, and I will add the gem uh, Slim Rails. There is a slim gem, uh, but I'm adding slim rails because it is going to have a dependency on slim, so it'll pull slim into our application. Slim rails gives us some extra benefits. It gives us some new generators so that when we do something like scaffolding up a resource, it will scaffold up that resource's views using slim instead of using ERB. And that's a really good way of learning Slim. You can scaffold up a Slim resource and look at the generated code and see how things are done from looking at that code. So I've got my Slim Rails in there. I'm going to, from the command line, run bundle install, which will pull in that new Slim Rails gem into my application. So that's built in already. OK, so I can do that here. Yep. Does it include the source files for the Or for, for like source mapping? Yeah. I don't know. I think, I think source mapping for SCSS is present. Okay. I think the asset pipeline handles that. Uh, for those of you who don't know what source mapping is, when you're writing in these transpiled languages, uh, debugging can become an issue because when something breaks in your browser, the errors you see are based on the generated code, not the code that you actually wrote yourself. And so if you were writing in CoffeeScript and your 
app crashes on some JavaScript, it's going to show the JavaScript that you didn't write that's going to show the compiled JavaScript. Or if your styles aren't quite working, it's going to show you the CSS that was generated rather than the SCSS. So a lot of uh, browsers allow for what's called source mapping. They give you the ability to actually see the source code that you wrote in that original pre-transpiled state rather than the, uh, the, the transpiled code. And I, I'm pretty sure that the SAS supports that. Uh, uh, and it should work with Chrome's source mapping. Is that feature of the browser? That's the feature of the browser and the backend technology. They sort of have to work hand in hand to allow for source mapping. But the browser is crucial to that feature. Okay. So what I'll do to demonstrate this stuff is I will do a scaffold. So I will do a Rails generate scaffold, and I will just scaffold it up a simple product where a product has a name, which is a string, a price, which is a decimal, and a description, which is text. And what should happen at this scaffolding step is now that the Slim Rails gem is present in my application, is that the scaffolding generator should generate Slim views rather than ERB views. And so notice that if we look up here, the views that were generated are all .html.slim rather than .html.erb. And that's following that pattern that, Ra that Rails uses for anything that is transpiled, uh, you get a double extension. So what the file actually is and what it's going to be transpiled into. So when it was erb, it was uh, html.erb transpiling from ERB into HTML. Now it's .slim at the end. Slightly different for something like the style sheets where they just have a SCSS extension. And you can put CSS into them or SCSS into them. Let's run this migration. DB migrate. That will give us our products table. And then we'll run the server and we'll just take a peek at the generated code. Ah! That is probably because at one point this crashed, so there is a old version of Puma running somewhere holding on to port 3000. Uh, so instead of trying to debug that, I will just um, run on a different port. Ah, you're right. <laughs> I, can't, I can't just do this, can I? Uh, mm. uh, <laughs> do I have a Puma? There it is. Where where are you? What's your? I think it's this one. Kill dash nine, my friend. There you go. Done. And now I should be able to run my server. So notice, like as a as a Rails developer, right? Because we're always working so intimately with Linux, it's helpful to know those kind of Linux commands, right? To be able to use ps to load up all of the processes that are running on your system, and to pipe that knowledge to Gref and be able to Gref for the actual process that you're looking for, find its process ID and be able to kill it. Like uh, Linux knowledge is crucial for being a web developer because you run into issues like this where. You know, otherwise I would have had to just kill Vagrant and start it over again. It's easier just to, to have the knowledge to, to be able to find that process and kill it. Okay. Over here I can 
head over to localhost slash products because that is what was scaffolded for me. And from a user perspective, this should look no different than a scaffolded application running on ERB. Right? The user is never going to know a difference because at this point, everything's been translated over to HTML. So I can create a new project or a new product. I make my shoe phone. Uh, create that. Everything works as expected. It looks just like a regular scaffolded app. Let's take a look though at the code that's powering this app and it'll give us the ability to, to see some of the features that Slim has to offer. So if we go to my views, to my products, uh, I can load up, for example, the index, maybe the new, the edit, the show, and the form. And here we have slim code. So we have an H1. Uh, when you have something that just has literal text inside of it, you don't need to indent that. You can just follow with the text. So this will create an H1 tag with the words listing products inside of it. Uh, here I have a table that is being created. That table has a T head with a single row in it with a number of header columns in it. Three of them are blank. Those are blank because there's no header information above show, edit, and destroy. And then inside of the table body, that's where we're jumping into ERB mode with a dash and looping over the products and for each product generating a table row with a column in it. And the equal signs here act as an echo statement to echo in the product name, price, description, and the various links for that. And then down below here, we have a line break and outputting a link to back to the new product path uh, with an equal sign. If we were to compare this with the uh, like similar code that had been scaffolded, probably have a scaffolded app here. Uh, probably simple store was that scaffolded? Let's see. don't know if I do have a scaffolded app. I will for sure up on GitHub though. So this is ERB code. So if we go to the index of this scaffolded app, you'll notice that it's, it's, it's very much the same code, but you know, written as regular old markup. So the R table with the T head, you got the close, the TR with the close TR, each of the THs. They do something a little fancy here where they sort of do a column span for that uh, TH. And there we're looping over the products, dropping down. So again, if we compare it, it, it's effectively the same, but it's just, I find it cleaner in this mode. So it's up to you whether or not you want to use Slim in your project. There are extra marks associated with using Slim. You don't want to make this something that you do as an afterthought. So you don't want to code up your whole website with ERB and then think, oh, I want those Slim marks. Now I'm going to try to convert every single one of my views to Slim. There are online tools, so if you, if you do a Google search for like ERB to Slim, there are tools where you can paste in ERB code and get Slim code out. And they work pretty well, like you'll, they'll get you 99% of the, the way there, but you'll still have to do some debugging and you would have to do that for every single one of your views. So that's not, uh, if you want the Slim marks, you probably want to start using Slim from the get-go. Uh, what else can I show you? Uh, well, for something like new and edit, notice that those are pretty short because they both share a form by way of a partial. Uh, there is some things, I often forget what some of the slim stuff does. Like 
double equal versus single equal, or equal greater than versus equal less than, or even this thing right here. Uh, equal greater than and equal less than, that, what those do is when the echo is performed, they will output white space for you, either at the beginning of the thing or at the end of the thing. And what they're trying to do here, uh, pipes have special meaning in SQL. So if you want a literal pipe, you escape it with a, with a single quote. So this will drop a single quote into your document and it will put a link with a space after it and then another link with a space before it so that there's spaces around that pipe symbol. So when you're learning SLIM, you have to sort of learn some of these special things. Thankfully, the SLIM documentation is really, really good. And so if you go to SLIM docs, we can see some of that stuff. And often it's just, you can just take a peek into here. Like here's the section for trailing and leading white space. And they talk about, about that. So it can not only be used with equal sign echoes, but you can also use it when you generate any different element. Uh, double equals versus single equals. That's dynamic content here. What is the double equals for? Use a double equals if you want to uh, disable escaping in your attribute. Uh, that is like the escaping of potentially like dangerous things like uh, less thans and greater thans. So when you want to render out a form, you want to render out a bunch of HTML. You don't want the less thans and greater thans to be escaped to their entities, the percent LT and the percent GT. Uh, that's what echoing normally will do because it's trying to do like cross-site scripting protection. Uh, but with, when you're rendering a form, you literally want to embed HTML into your form. It's not an attack. And so you do a double equals for that compared to a single equals for these. Uh, and then, yeah, they share this form partial. And you can see how that form partial looks. We got echoing out form for a particular product. If there are any errors, we drop a div with an ID of error explanation. And within that div, we have an H2 a UL with a number of LIs. And then down below here, we drop a bunch of divs. Each div gets a class. This one gets a class of field. And if you wanted to be more explicit about it, you could say div.field. If you wanted to add more classes to it, you could have another class chained on like that. So that's the, the really quick introduction to Slim. If we go and head over to the assets folder. One of the things that scaffolding does is it adds a scaffolds.scss file to our folder. And so if we look at that, we can get some access to, uh, that's a weird error message. We get some access to seeing how uh, SCSS works. So you get to see things here where we're <laughs> defining rules for an A tag. So these are rules for a link. And then we're defining the pseudo properties for that link for like the visited and the hover uh, nested within the link itself. So that's sort of a, an interesting thing. Same thing goes here uh, in this form where we had a div with called error explanation and an H2, a UL, and LI nested within those. In the SESS, the hierarchy matches. So we have the error explanation, an H2 nested within that error explanation. And then here's an example of using regular CSS matching. So UL LIs that happen to be inside of error explanation will be targeted by these rules here. So you can learn a lot about both SLIM and SCSS by just going through that scaffolding process and seeing the, the generated code. And as I said, there's marks for using both of them. The marks associated with using SCSS involve using all the various aspects of SCSS. So you have to have made use of some variables. You have to have made use of um, you know, some inheritance, those kind of things. If you're using Atom, you probably also want to pull in a few new packages. Uh, so you'll notice that my slim gets proper uh, sort of text highlighting. 
That's only because I have a special package uh, added into things here. So if I go to my settings, I can show you those. And then the other thing I shared with the other section is the concept of linters and Atom. Uh, does anyone know what a linter is in the, the web world? Jade. That's exactly what it is. So in the world of markup languages and dynamic languages, because we don't have compilers, we can end up writing sort of messy or non-standard code. And so we have tools like Rubocop uh, to sort of have us conform to particular conventions. And linters extend that idea to all sorts of different languages. So what I have set up in Atom is I have a package called language slim that gives me the ability to have text highlighting for slim. Uh, SCSS is just so common in the web world today that Atom just comes with SCSS text highlighting built in. It's just, it's just a very, very common technology. So you don't have to add anything to get that. If you want some linters in your Atom uh, to deal with these new languages, uh, you first find this linter package, and it's the one with this, uh, <laughs> the description is a base linter with cow powers. That's, that's the specific linter that you need. I don't know what cow powers are, but, uh, but once you grab that particular linter, there's a whole bunch of linter dash packages that provide linting for different technologies. So I have um, linter eslint, which lints my JavaScript. I have linter PHP, which lints my PHP when I'm coding in that. Uh, this linter's throwing errors for me right now, but it's uh, an SCSS linter. I have a slim linter built in as well. And because I have Rubocop uh, deployed locally, I can enable a Rubocop linter as well and then get Rubocop um, linting within Atom uh, in that way. And I've also used this linter style lint, which just does linting for CSS, regular old CSS. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to use, if you're going to use Slim, you probably want the Slim linter and the Slim language package for uh, text highlighting. And I think, unless there's any questions, do, is there any questions about uh, technologies like Slim or SCSS? Yeah. So in all the previous instances where we've used Rubocop, we just run it against like a single ER file. But this point you're using it on the, the Rails product. And when you run it in Rails, it's just kind of like it's a little overwhelming because one, it seems to conflict with a lot of the automatic code. Yes. And so I'm trying to figure out like what are the best practices for using Rubocop in every project where you're like if you want to be ignoring some of the layers, you want to be going in and just manually editing all the layers code first to keep the thing. Yes, and I will highly recommend not touching the auto-generated code. I have at the very bottom of the uh, of the project document. What I found is Rubocop dash L just gives you the actual coding violation to not be stuck on the bottom of the Okay. And there's also a dash capital R, which makes it more Rails specific. It adds in additional Rails stuff. Yeah, but I've also but it doesn't fix the problems with Rails that that's just running Rubocop dash R. And I did that by way of creating a special config file. So if you I go <laughs> what I did is I, I like flagged it to, to ignore particular directories. But then you still go to those directories and have to modify those files sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, so I'll just quickly show you what I've created and it'll be up to you to whether or not you want to use it or not. But at the very bottom here, there is a... Yeah, they're not going to count. But it's, it's also annoying to have like all of the errors that, that are not your responsibility showing up. And so I have created this, this Rubocop where I have it specifically uh, exclude 
the DB folder, the config folder, the script, the bin, the test, and also the app admin folder. So although you will be working in that folder, the app admin um, whitelisting files, those I just sort of, they often break the rules, and so I, I ignore those. And then I turned off uh, this one. It was causing problems when we were switching between Ruby versions that supported UTF-8 encoding natively and not. Um, turned off the documentation one, which forces all classes to have docs at the top of them. Uh, and then I bumped the max line length, which you know often bugs students. Uh, bumped it up to 99. And so if you do that, you can run Rubocop minus R for Ruby mode and then minus C, and you can point to this particular uh, config file. It'll make it a little bit more manageable. And I'm, I'm fine with you also editing this file and potentially uh, disabling some of the you know other cops that you might not agree with or that you feel like you don't want to use. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions or comments about either Slim, CS, SCSS, or the project? Are we going to talk about this problem? We will. So there's there's only a few more topics that I really want to cover in this course. Uh, one of them is Bootstrap. Uh, often the way to get Bootstrap into a Rails application is by way of a gem. Uh, we'll talk about that. I also want to do a lecture on using the Stripe API for credit card processing and a lecture or maybe multiple lectures on deployment, one for deployment to Heroku and one for deployment to DigitalOcean. Uh, but that's, that's sort of it. There's not going to be too many more lectures. Uh, our class tomorrow, we have a class tomorrow? Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a work period. And so that'll give you some time to get some work done because our first milestone is next week. So we'll have some lectures at the beginning of next week, but probably three hours of marking available. There is one more challenge, uh, and that I will, it's probably best for me to present that early, but give it a farther out deadline, so I'll present that tomorrow. Well, it will be, but I'll, I'll just, that, that's the one thing I will talk about, just so that it's out in the open, that there is one more challenge. I can record it as a lecture. I can, I can make a video for you. Is it a video? Two hours. Two hours. Can you do it in the same hour?